the beautiful community. Now, you are going to tell me if you can hear me, and you're going to tell me if you can see me. And when you tell me that, I'm going to say, the beautiful community, and we're ready to get going. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do with your permission is climb upstairs a bit and see what questions were left at the top and uh, jump through them at a kind of rapid pace. And then I've just noticed a few remarks asking me to say something about Gaza, and I will briefly, but I'll condition that heavily because this generates toxicity in internet discourse when we go there. Shouldn't stop us from going there. So, beautiful community, let's get going. I'm just back from a day and a half in the countryside. I'll show you a couple of pictures on the community post later. Um, it was a bit of a disaster health-wise because I wasn't well enough to make the trip. Um, and I'm going to go as well as I can with you. And if I gas out and I stop bringing you value and stop making sense, we're going to cut this show off early. Rodrigo, can you comment on the possible nuclear weapons proliferation among members of the West spurred by the war in Ukraine and Trump's threat um, to withdraw from NATO? Not my expertise. So I can say something bigger picture than what you want. And that is um, spread of, of countries possessing nuclear weapons and use and normalization of the use of nuclear weapons at a level that is short of apocalyptic is something that there is a chance of us um, or uh, the next generation witnessing with a degree of normalization in the next hundred years. That's a possibility. Um, in Europe, there are all kinds of discussions about bringing Germany um, into a, a, a nuclear umbrella together with France and the UK, but that does not mean violating the non-proliferation treaty. That would not mean Germany directly having nuclear weapons. Again, defense analysts are much better than me on this. Mikita, what's your view on the POW interviews that are hosted by Zolkin? I don't know them at all, so I can't comment. We will be commenting on some films soon, um, also depending on what wins what awards. Um, um, the Mariupol film, of course, is something some of you have asked me to comment on. It's a very important document, so it's a very significant piece of um, testimony, piece of work, piece of German uh, journalism, but it's a poor film. Uh, which people are not recognizing because um, of political correctness. I might give a review of it at some point. Kidney stones, what's an alternative history for you if Prigozhin were to occupy Moscow for at least a month? The, the, the problem with visualizing that is that Prigozhin for that needed two things. He needed not just a systemic critique of the regime which he offered, and that critique was based on incompetence. You are all incompetent. You're trying to do a war, you can't do a war. You, I bet if you tried to do a peace, you couldn't do a peace. You can't do a thing. You're inept. That was the critique. It was a powerful critique that almost transcended and went across both the uh, Z radicals and the uh, some of the um, uh, liberal democratic opposition. What Prigozhin lacked was an alternative vision for what he would do. He lacked a sort of a manifesto of here is what I do with the army, here is what I do with um, uh, the regime if I inherited it, uh, he, he, he'd be my foreign policy, um, you know, here's my economic policy, um, here's my future vision of Russia. If he had that and a bigger um, line of military machinery marching on Moscow, um, then we could more plausibly 
sort of entertain your question. But I think what happened to Prigozhin, he got caught up in the revolutionary situation that did indeed begin to teeter on being a revolutionary situation, but it was one that surprised him, him uh, uh, as well, even though he, he is the creator of it. Um, another question, would Russian oligarchs stage a coup against Putin? How would it affect the Ukraine war? There are no oligarchs in Russia. Oligarchs uh, really means people who have economic and political power. There are no people in Russia who have political power in which having economic power. Oligarchs are in the pocket of the regime. Mika is asking a question, I think, too big for me to rush through um, Sweden's in NATO. What, if anything, is your opinion on Turkey and Hungary being really difficult about this? Orban is a difficult problem. Um, mm. Orban is manageable so long as the alliances stay strong. EU, NATO. I am predicting, certainly with the EU, um, a gradual sort of um, degeneration of the ligaments that hold the, the EU together over the next quarter century. Um, and so for now, these alliances are strong enough to deal with the Orban nuisance, but we don't know how far that'll be the case in the future. But this is too big a question. It's a very good question. Jasper, what are your thoughts? This is going to be a 20-second answer because we're a bit off topic here, but that's okay too. What are your thoughts on the current man sphere and how dating apps affect society? So it's not a right-wing pseudo-intellectual dark web conspiracy to say we have a crisis of men in our society. I think we do have a crisis of men. And I think a, a, a spectacular way in which this is revealed is actually via sociological look at what is happening on dating apps in Paris, in London, in Rome, in New York. Um, we're seeing some real challenges and we're seeing some challenges that are not being met. In terms of the content mansphere, if that's what you mean, um, we're experiencing, of course, a crisis of algorithmic drift, um, but about both of these things, we have to say a lot more on another occasion. Speck is asking me about Macron. I just refer you back to my analysis, which is the last video in the chat channel, simply because I don't have anything new to add about what Macron is trying to do than what I say in that video. Possibly you haven't seen it, in which case watch it. If you have, I'll add new thoughts um, when I feel another layer of analysis um, is available from me. Modit, hi Vlad, are US citizens as depoliticized members of the Russian blob? No, um, US citizens are resistant increasingly to their political institutions, um, but they're not resistant to all politics. Um, the Russian depoliticized blob is resistant to all politics. So the depoliticized U.S. citizens are politically active because they have lost trust in their institutions. Difference. The Russians are resisting all politics. They're not rebelling against the politics that cease to make sense to them. Gaffer, Bob, do you think it's somewhat inevitable that both communism and democratic capitalism end in authoritarian plutocracy? No, it's certainly not. And Putin is wrong to see our decline as non-contingent um, and sort of inexorable and sort of historically ordained. Having said this, the natural drift in European politics is right authoritarianism across most European countries, I'm afraid. Dimitro is asking, mm, hearing you talk about the crisis of trust, um, I understand a lack of understanding of the details, trust is a relationship with two sides, which uh, on which side are the problems? On almost none of the key issues that we face in our democracies, contrary to our repeated behavior, is it right to proceed in terms of us and them? Instead, it's right to proceed in terms of pressures, challenges that act on all of us to which we react differently. So the um, uh, crisis of trust is a four plus four problem. Um, cartoonishly speaking, we have got um, untethering of various kinds of social bonds, community bonds, 
much more diffuse society. We've got the disinhibiting nature of our social media. We have got ideologies of authenticity dri driven psychic self realization, which are acting against solidarity and the public good. And we've got mechanisms of exclusion that persist. That's four um, social forces, four psychological responses to political institutions are the feeling of being unsafe because you feel your government is incompetent. That's the least scary. Then you have feeling disempowered. You can't inflect the political process at all, not even to an infinitesimal degree. You feel powerless. Yes. Second feeling. The third feeling is a feeling of being betrayed. And you think that your political representatives are not just people you don't agree with. You think they're evil. They're acting against you perhaps prioritizing outsiders. So betrayal. And the worst emotion is that sense that your political system is opaque to you, that it's not just betraying you, it's not just leaving you without a capacity to influence it, inflect it in any way, it's leaving you with a conviction that it's unintelligible. And if it doesn't make sense, what's the point of keeping it? So four plus four. I'll be talking more about this. Um, Alex is asking something about Israel, Palestine, how do I process this, which side do I take? And Christian is also saying, hope you talk about Gaza today. Um, so I'm going to make a rule for us today, and um, then I'm going to jump into the comment section after probably spending five minutes on this. My rule is that I am going to do a systematic refresh about where we're at on um, the Middle East crisis. And that will come in the form of a live, perhaps, so we can ask questions specifically about that. We might do a few thematic Q&As. These might be more helpful. As you can see, we're just going all over the place. Um, and uh, let me just take one question out of context. Alexei Vankiewicz is asking, what do you think of Vladimir Pastuchov's line of thought, which, which, um, I think he's one of the best commentators on Russia. He does not comment as an academic. He comments as a social critic, really, and I think a very insightful one. And it's also very beautiful to witness the kind of relationship he's developing with his um, son, because they're now doing a program together on YouTube, which is, which is very moving, and they don't trample on each other in a very, very beautiful way. Um, so, you know, it, it depends on what you're looking for. It does not give the same kind of intellectual history and academic contextualization that somebody like Greg Uden would, um, but it gives it an equally valid, equally significant um, set of reflections as a, as a sort of highly intuitive, responsibly speculating social critic. Back to where we were, Israel-Gaza. Mm. I'm not your intellectual taxi, except sometimes, in the sense that I'm not here um, to um, drive you to the destination you choose in the sense of the topic and the views on it you want. But I am your intellectual taxi in another sense, and that's that my job is to make something available to you that might be useful to you. And that's different to simply, hey guys, I've got my opinions and there, there you go, listen to them now. That can be constructive, but fundamentally that's not what I'm doing here. I'm not just sitting here and regurgitating my opinions as they evolve. Um, th that is very different to what I'm trying to build here. And so as soon as 7th of October happened, I began building a particular kind of chair for you. And that chair was based on a very, very important principle that I thought was really important to begin elaborating. And that is that the value of civilian lives in conflict, in combat, um, 
remains the same whatever the justness of the causes at hand on either side are. And then I qualified that, because that is roughly a position that Michael Waltz and Avishai Margalit, um, the wonderful Israeli philosopher and the wonderful American philosopher, put on the pages of the New York Review of Books about 20 years in the context of Israel's politics. And what they said is that when Israel engages in military operations and Palestinians are on the wrong end of it, it should think of Palestinian civilians as though they were Israeli civilians. And so I started with that principle and I began elaborating it over and over and over, there perhaps half a dozen videos around October, November time where I repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated deliberately with one elaboration. And that is that I thought that um, no state could actually conduct itself that way by prioritizing uh, people it sees as outsiders the way it would prioritize people it sees as, it own, as its own. There always has to be a gap realistically. But I said that gap should be a magnetically held gap. In other words, the way you treat the civilians on the other side should not drift too far from how you treat them if it, if they were your civilians, right? If the operation wasn't in Gaza, but it was in Haifa. So that drift is inevitable, but it shouldn't be too big. And I used that entryway because I thought it would be illuminating in a way that went beyond the particular conflict we were looking for, but at the same time went right to the core of it. This community is deeply sympathetic to the plight of folks in Gaza. This community also tendentiously recognizes the, exist, the right to exist of the state of Israel and various other rights Israel might have. But this community is also big on recognizing the uh, structural injustices Israel is implementing. About 15% of this community think that I am being I was being too hard on Israel. A slightly bigger number, about 20%, felt that I was being too soft on Israel. So that's kind of where we are. In other words, the majority of this community feels that what Israel has been doing is unacceptable uh, after the barbaric terror attack of October 7th. While I several times said that Israel's response is ethically and politically unacceptable as well as will be counterproductive, as it is proving to be, and devoid of strategy, and we've got a, a double void of strategy. Israel has no strategy toward Gaza, and the United States has no strategy towards Israel's conduct in Gaza. So we're talking about real imperial retreat here. Imperial in a neutral sense. And um, the US empire can do a lot of good. Um, but despite the fact that I said that, I spent the vast majority on this key combatant, non-combatant principle, because I don't need to impose on you what, what balance you should strike here. That's up to you to do, not up to me to do for you. It's up to me to give get a guidance, but it's up to you to disregard that. It's to use it and disregard it. But on that combatant, non-combatant distinction, I felt I could bring a lot of value. And I emphasized it and re-emphasized it and re-emphasized it. I do think many people in this community did not understand what an eviscerating criticism, just that elementary elaboration of that combatant, non-combatant uh, distinction was of Israel's policy. Um, think about the idea of either treating folks, civilians in Gaza, as though they were um, uh, your own people, right? And think about either doing that or, or not drifting too far from that and compare that to the reality of what we've seen. So that's my contribution as a public intellectual was for sort of five, ten 
episodes to go over and over and over this combatant non-combatant distinction which i think goes to the heart of an adequate ethical and political response to what we, what we were witnessing that's one thing to say the second thing to say is that my other community the western intellectual community the western academic community has in my judgment failed on the issue and it failed because there was an absence of a um, double acknowledgement, um, a, a, a sufficiently universal double acknowledgement, where you say there were no liberatory credentials to what Hamas did on October 7th. And you say Israel's response needed to comply with various international norms and glaringly failed to. We saw a lot of people emphasizing one but not the other and we saw an extraordinary incapacity among Western academics, Western intellectuals to appropriately acknowledge both. So that's a very, very important, um, almost civilizational moral failing um manifesting in staggering incapacity to diagnose the absence of liberatory credentials of the barbarism of october 7th and then a stunning incapacity to recognize the unacceptability of the scale of destruction of innocent life in gaza on a very very vast scale and that double acknowledgement has still not manifested in the West. And it's also been very politically counterproductive that it's been absent. Algorithmically, this is difficult to talk about um, because um, it, it generates just really toxic conduct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off for the purpose of this live um, a discussion of this issue, unless it happens to be exceptionally soft in the comments. So anything hard on on any side, I'm gonna I'm gonna afraid I'm gonna have to put you in a timeout because I know how poorly equipped we are. I, this is just the reality we have to face to communally engage on this issue. But I promise I'm gonna come back to it. I'm committed to it. As you know, um, it's algorithmically catastrophic for me to uh, engage in this topic, um, but it's my responsibility to do so, and I'll continue to do so. So we'll have a separate episode where I might take um, questions just on that topic. Okay, enough on this. Let me see what I missed. Naive questions. I have friends who will only take, uh, from Monsieur Nothing, who will only take US commitments to Gaza seriously if they stop weapons sales to Israel. Why don't they? How can Biden say he wants to help and say he dislikes? Okay, so I, I, I'm grateful for your super chat. And I think we will take on that question in a separate conversation on Israel and Gaza. What I will say is that just like the United States lacks a strategy toward Ukraine, it lacks a strategy toward Israel at the moment. Israel itself lacks a strategy toward Gaza. It's not easy to have a strategy because Israel is a very important ally strategically, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, the United States is dramatically undermined on the global stage by its complicity in the disproportionate nature of Israel's response and by its incapacity to contextualize everything that's happened since October in the wider patterns of the conflict. Um, because, of course, there is no serious um, will on either side of that conflict for a um, solution a two-state solution or some other solution. And the only place that's going to come from is external. And it ain't coming externally because we have, if you like, strategic retreat by the West. So the, the, the answer to your question, which I'm not giving now, will come under the theme of strategic Western retreat. And we'll get there, I promise. Thank you for being patient with me. 
Let's go. French. How do we reconcile the fact that American military industrial complex is helping Ukraine? It's run by a very small number of people whose objective could be debatable um, and could be permanent permanent war. Um, the caricatural answer is that our only machinery to stop Russia's destructive imperial contact is a benign intervention by um, and, and I'm here pliant, actually, I don't insist you call the US an empire, I call it an empire, a, a, a benign intervention from the US empire. There is no other mechanism to stop um, an expansive and rather fanatically escalatory uh, Kremlin threat, distinctly different to the Soviet threat. There is no way to stop this, um, except with one tool, and that tool is the US empire. If the US empire goes away, Europe can't do it. So um, that's the choice we're, we're facing. That does not mean that the uh, US empire isn't structurally motivated to engage in various kinds of destructive activities. All it does mean is that certain things it can do, for instance, what it did in Bosnia, can be... Um, examples of solutions to global problems which are simply unavailable without u.s imperial reach i'd put it like this you see i'm using the term empire neutrally or at least neutrally up to the point that i believe that there there, there can be imperial extension of power imperial projection of power that can be in particular instances benign and what I would say about the Ukraine conflict, Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, is that there, um, um, the US tendency is not, in fact, to prop up Ukraine as, as far as possible. The US tendency is there to retreat. And it's a tendency the US is trying to battle with now. Um, but it may not be able to control itself for various complex institutional reasons. I'm grateful I'm not seeing an absolute outbreak of toxicity toward each other on Gaza. And I'm very grateful for that uh, because I understand the emotions running really, really high on this. And I, I, promise, we'll, I promise we'll come back there. Um, I do recognize that this community tilts in a in a particular direction and is broadly compassionate um, with the calamity, the unacceptable calamity that's befallen the people of Gaza. But at the same time, this community also respects certain of Israel's rights. Um, and uh, that means we're not entirely divided on it, but I do think there's a 15% of people here who believe Israel's response is proportionate. And that's why I also warn us to handle ourselves on this because this is extremely delicate and I'm extremely grateful to you. Thoughts on Judith Butler's claim. So Judith wrote a piece, I think it may have been in the London Review of Books, about the liberatory or otherwise credentials of the um, uh, Hamas attack. And um, I'm going to move on from this topic, but briefly, what she said in that piece is better what she, than what she said in some other interviews, um, in my opinion. And no, I do not believe in recognizing any liberatory, liberatory credentials there. And I believe that in some of the remarks we, we heard from Judith, Judith Butler, we got too much investment in, in a liberatory side um, in a liberatory um, dimension to what happened, and I don't, I don't believe that that's a correct weighing at all of of what happened. Um, and um, I, I say that as somebody who is evisceratingly critical of of what Israel has been up to in, in recent, in, in particular in recent weeks. Um, but interestingly. Um, Judith Butler's 
path. Now, Wendy Brown is a very, very important, very important, very good philosopher um, who I admire and who has rather different views, actually, to do the battle on, on, on truth, even. Um, let's go. Uh, oh, State of the Union. Did I miss a State of the Union? State of the Union. Somebody asked me about the State of the Union upstairs. I'm not going to say too much, except that for the for the for the first part of it, um, and it went downhill later. Biden's cognitive performance was considerably above av average. Um, and sort of key reproductive rights points were hit. There was a lot of things that went in 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 um, were there to appease different parties. Um, there's nothing dramatic to say about it, um, but I think one of the central aims of it actually was about Biden's physical condition coming across as tolerable. Um, and that is an absolute crisis as we go into the next election um, at the level of the, the US public understanding what's up and being very deeply concerned about it. Um, it's very unfortunate that we're stuck in this situation. As it happens, my judgment of Biden's decision-making capacity is that it's actually still in excellent order, but he is suffering very, very significant cognitive decline. Um, that is... Uh, degrading democratic trust, just the sight of it is degrading democratic trust, I'm afraid. Um, so as we get close to 2024, we'll be talking about all of this. I have special insight into what Biden is going through as somebody who, in a different way, has myself gone through much more dramatic cognitive decline and what he's going through. Um, so I've got a lot to say about this, both politically and neurologically. Um, and I will be providing that analysis because um, given my background, I think I have to. Jan, which lines of Western propaganda have we thus far been exposed to in the West since the beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian war? Uh, it's hard to pick out anything unitary precisely because we don't have a strategy. I think that's the answer. Um, so we think in six months slots about what's going to happen in Ukraine at best and then cross our fingers largely, um, hoping something comes up. And makes the situation better for us and for Ukraine. So um, I, I, I don't really know how to answer that question until we get into a series of sort of micro bubbles. Um, we could get into the Ukrainian internet, we could get into the Russian opposition internet, we could get into the Western folks who just don't get the threat Putin poses. We could get into Western folks who distrust institutions and therefore distrust support for Ukraine that way, which you've got to be very empathetic with. But I think globally, I, I, I'm, unless I'm exhausted and can't think of something, but globally I can't pick something out precisely because we don't have a strategy that we're trying to pump out, even at the level of discourse. Let me scroll up and down a little bit.
Jan, Jan is saying Haley versus Harris would have been less bad. Um, Kamala Harris is an atypically untrusted and unpopular political communicator. Um, Could you define an empire? No, I can't define an elephant, even Connor is asking me. Um, I'll spend a bit of time talking about that at some point. What I will say briefly is that um, if in your capital city decisions about the fates of two or three or seven different countries are being made, um, is a good candidate can you're a good candidate for being a kind of empire light at least relative time works international polarization isolation has made the preposterous palatable and criminalized compromised we're in a post integrity era in a post-truth era, I would say to moderates flee the arena is there a way back no there is no way back and that's really important, that what we've lost, we've lost. So that doesn't mean there aren't ways forward that makes the situation less bad in some ways, but that involves a serious reckoning with the political project of giving agency to the people who feel that currently they can't express political agency in, in, except in terms of cashing it out in a post-factual, post-truth manner. So it's our fault it's our society's fault that we've got large chunks of our citizenry stuck in a situation where they feel either sort of eviscerated as political agents or uh, they feel they can express their political agency but via half truths how do we get out of that situation? How do we inspire people into a safe sense of agency that is at the same time truthful is one of the challenges of the years to come. Zonko is asking me if I think the Democratic Party are essentially gaslighting their voters by denying that Biden has a serious mental illness. Biden doesn't have a mental illness. Biden has neurological decline, cognitive decline. Um, Biden once did make a joke. So he made it several times, but once he made it very explicitly. He pretended to walk off stage disoriented. And when there was a thud in the audience, he said, that's not me, commenting on his um, falls. Um, this is really hard, but my strategy would be to acknowledge it. Yes, much more, rather than pretend it's not there. Because it's not just that people are being ghastly and they see it, but you know, being it being denied just pisses them off. It's that denying it inherently undermines trust in everything, in all political institutions. Um, so Biden should be closer to the position of saying, hey guys, um, I'm making really good decisions. I'm a competent political actor, but I've gassed out cognitively because of my age. But for goodness sake, choose me over the other guy. A less cartoonish version of this is better. And what nobody's honestly said to the American people is a truth that, said it en masse, is a truth that comes between these two extremes. One side says Biden doesn't have a problem, he's got a stutter which is so profoundly disrespectful and offensive to voters who know better. And the other side says Biden is not making any decisions because he is just gone. He's just a puppet. The truth is Biden is actually a more efficacious operator than Obama in some dimensions of domestic politics, actually. not I'm not judging the policy. I'm talking about the efficacy of getting things done. Biden has actually been, on his own terms, we're not going to evaluate these terms now, reasonably effective. Um, 
And so the truth, and this is a difficult truth to understand when you just don't trust politics, is that Biden looks ridiculous, but he's actually functional at the moment. It's a calamity that he is running for a second term. It's a calamity the country might be stuck with uh, insofar as it just degrades democracy um, and increases Trump's chances of winning. Um, Trump's probably got an over 50% chance of winning at the moment if we're going to be cartoonish with, with odds, which we shouldn't because it's uncertain. But as a psychological clue, it's over 50%. And uh, that truth is unavailable. You either say there is no problem or you go conspiratorial and you say that things are what they, aren't what they seem and puppets uh, you know, uh, is what your politicians are. Um, so another opportunity being missed to treat your voters as intelligent as they are or even more intelligent than they are. Peter, do you think that the less aggressive U.S. foreign policy could have prevented uh, the current Russian aggression? Maybe not, but it's made the West situation much, much worse. Much, much worse. The West is being punished for Iraq. The West lacks credibility and for some other interventions. So the West's capacity to oppose Putin's project would have been incomparably greater if it stuck remotely close to its own principles, if it hadn't drifted farcically wide of the principles it was proclaiming itself, for itself, it, the situation would have been much easier. However, I do not think that Putin's aggression against Ukraine is simply a result of NATO expansion, the way John Mearsheimer thinks, because I believe that we have got a fanatical, quasi-mystical project, largely driven by a combination of mystical visions and ideas about regime security at home. So what is intolerable to that project is, in fact, a democratic and free Ukraine on its borders. Even the Ukraine that's democratic and free and not in NATO is an almost mortal threat to the Putin regime. So my answer would be to you more no than yes, but with a lot of yes there, with a lot of yes, which says that part of the catastrophic collapse of the global order, even though it was probably inevitable anyway, is the Western capacity to be remotely conducting itself in a way that it, it could be taken seriously globally as being committed to its own principles. And I think what some of what we're seeing in the Middle East now is again an expression of this. Um, and um, th this matters in challenging the Putin regime. This also matters in isolating the Putin regime. How many people can you get on board, as it were, in the room, the room being countries in the world, who say, okay, I'm with you. Parks, what changes uh, in the Russia Ukrainian war could shift Schultz's position on, on the latest um, cru cruise missile dispute? Well, um, th the way that needs to be agreed is different politically in Germany than it is in some other European countries, which means that it, it, he doesn't have the political. Um, uh, uh, freedom, as it were, to just push that through um, the way a British leader could. Um, so there is also that. But the the big consequence of your question is when's a clear strategy going to align itself about what red lines are, what level of support is 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 appropriate. What do we accept? What do we not accept in terms of Russian escalation? How do we understand the Putin regime? Um, yeah, th th that's all missing. And it's doubly missing. In other words, we're missing both the psychology of the Putin regime. We're treating them as too much irrational uh, with a capital R, not a small R. All actors are rational. Um, but uh, we're missing um, a sense of the mystical fanaticism of, of the Kremlin and 
we're also misunderstanding the nature of their escalatory project. And that's kind of, I think there's a chat on the, there's a video on the main channel, we've got to face reality, something like that, uh, from the last few weeks. And I outlined that. I don't think we've made progress in terms of this. Um, I think the Biden administration has done some things really well. Early on, it did nuclear escalation management really well, but it hasn't developed strategically. Um, in relation to this crisis, such that when Putin says he prefers Biden over Trump, he is lying. He prefers Trump, but he is a little bit not lying insofar as he is he is in many ways happy with the Biden administration as things stand. He just wants more. He wants more. And he thinks he might get it with Trump. But he's also scared of the uncertainty of Trump. Um there's a part of Putin who thinks, which thinks that Trump could be worse than Biden, while on balance, Putin thinks Biden is worse for Russia, much worse for Russia than Trump. But um, not bad. In other words, Putin sees himself as, if not necessarily winning, then having strategic momentum on his side. Few comments on NATO. Now, don't go all or nothing here on NATO. Um, the way NATO extended was a disaster. It was a disaster and certainly contributed to this war. So the, the people who say NATO expansion has nothing to do with this war are, quite frankly, borderline being disingenuous. They're being activists. But NATO expansion isn't the central feature here is true right and so we reject Mir Scheimer's analysis we'll reject it in a lot of detail I hope in the next couple of months on the main channel um, but it, it, it played a role and, and here it doesn't matter how you go really um, uh, some people for instance argue that a much faster NATO expansion that just took NATO boom all the way to Russia's borders would have done better um, in the collapse of the global order video in the main channel, I talk about the, what was at the time uh, uh, an option on um, a kind of a, a, a more layered approach to NATO membership that had to be scuppered at some point. So, so there were many, many different possibilities. Um, and we made it the worst of all possible worlds in the way we handled this. And also, of course, announcing that we were we were keen for Ukraine to join even when we weren't is worse than not doing that or worse than creating the possibility for Ukraine to join rapidly. <laughs> anyway, there's a series of failings. So don't just say NATO expansion has nothing to do with it. It has quite a lot to do with this. And um, don't lose that empathy that a democratic Russian leader of any kind who wasn't Yeltsin um, in the 90s would have found NATO and would have been right to find NATO a threat to Russia's national security. If, if you don't see that, you're just not thinking clearly. Um, so what Putin has done is perceived NATO as an existential threat to Russian security. That wouldn't have happened. Um, but any democratic leader of Russia already by the time Russia was becoming less democratic in the 90s, would have said, hey guys, this alliance is kind of aimed at us and it hasn't significantly reformed itself since it was aimed at us during the Cold War. So how are we meant to feel good about it? So that was that would have been inevitably the response of any Russian leader. In other words, it's not that if Garry Kasparov was president of Russia, he would have reacted differently. If Garry Kasparov was president of Russia, he would have said, NATO is a security challenge for us. Let's work out what to do about this. W what Kasparov wouldn't have done is he, he wouldn't have subjugated the sovereignty of um, East European countries to decide their own fate. Be and what they wanted was to run away from Russia. 
Um, so I'm just saying, um, let's not be completely black or white here when we deny the Mir Shaima NATO story, which is rightly to be denied. Um, th there's a lot of nuance to be introduced here. Um, that's it first. Um, Georgia is, is in a tough position. Georgia is stuck with a minimal effective dose of compliance with Russia, with Russia's interests. And it's very hard to see how to pull Georgia out of that dynamic. Um, because the choice might be that kind of compliance versus more terrible things happening and the way to get georgia properly out of that situation quite frankly is to politicize the um uh ex-soviet space politicize the russian space the belarusian space and the removal of putin's project is really the fundamental solution there um short of that i don't see how georgia can become fully unstuck Rotso says, you say that assigning odds to uncertainty is incorrect. Well, what I do fundamentally in a cartoonish way is I distinguish situations of uncertainty from situations of risk management. Um, and when we're in a situation of uncertainty, my cartoonish guide is to think of the odds as being closer to 50-50. Um, but when I talk of odds, I'm not saying anything philosophical. I use those just as psychological clues. Um, but there are some situations of genuine uncertainty. For example, if an entirely new um, virus comes up that we've never heard of, in 2027 and we need to ask a question like what will be the rate of post-viral um, sequelae from that virus how many people are going to stay sick if they get it whether mildly or seriously is going to be one percent 71 percent that would be uncertain in that situation and therefore giving odds of 10 percent or 90 percent wouldn't make sense because we precisely lack the information we need to give odds of this kind so it would be a situation of uncertainty in that case with the political examples I've, i'm giving we have a lot more factors available to us to consider now you're taking me in a philosophical direction maybe in the philosophy channel we'll talk about this a little bit at some point How far do you think the West lack of strategy goes, 90s, 70s? I would say that the crisis of trust perhaps goes back to the 70s, culminating in the 2010s. The West lack of strategy goes to a time when democratic um, uh, globalization sort of stopped um, well over a decade ago. And we began to shift the other way in terms of how many democracies were appearing and disappearing globally. And at that point, we were really coming out of the post-1989 global order. And instead of exploring a kind of reimagining of the international order, most of our political um, leaders continued to talk the talk of the post-1989 global order. Um, and they did that even as that order was declining. You saw that a little bit in the um, Biden speech we're just talking about. This sort of awkwardness. Do we talk about the international order, which is in disarray and which we're powerless to redress? Um, or do we not? Because it's kind of embarrassing if we go on about it. It's transparent that we're, we're drifting here. So um, we're really talking about, I would say, the first decade of this century where we didn't wake up 
to the fact that the arrangements on the international scene were melting down and we carried on talking about it as, as though they they, they um, were something that they were not. We were little by little beginning to address the world, a world that wasn't there. A good example of somebody who is a bit like this today is the um, uh, new UK Foreign Secretary, Dave Cameron, who used to be the Prime Minister. Dave is still rather stuck in the post-1989 world order. He talks as though it's still alive, as though it's still rescuable. Whatever else he's beginning to suspect and understand now, that tendency is the default tendency that he has. Um, and that's a problem. Um, but there are two stages here. One's recognizing this. And the other is doing something about it. Biden kind of recognizes. I mean, he's even made a speech saying the global order has collapsed. Um, but what, is the, what are the solutions to this? And this raises really big questions like, is NATO part of the problem or part of the solution? Let's say it's part of the solution. How? What reform does NATO need to be part of the solution? What, what, what solution is that solution? What are the principles that need to be proposed? Um, how are we going to galvanize faith that Western powers are going to comply with the principles they propose? How are Western powers are going to propose principles at all if their democracies are in such di disarray that they don't have the ground you need to stand on to generate principles of this kind? Um, but the, the video on the main channel, which has music a little bit too loud, unfortunately, is um, something like the post-1989 post global order has collapsed. And I discuss these issues a little bit with a little bit more concentration there. But I think that when we really ran out of gas but pretended we hadn't, that's sort of the end of the first decade of this century. Siliton, um, would it be use a usable strategy to freeze the front at borders of annexed oblasts and hope Putin's successor will return land in exchange for raising sanctions? In exchange for lifting sanctions. Well, Putin's successor is not coming. And we, we have a problem here, namely that um, we can't accept in anything other than a, an act of almost unsustainable weakness, give these to Putin um, because that's a platform for him to, as it were, build back better, which in Putin's <laughs> vernacular means a, a bigger, better war later. Um, so we can't concede them. We might well end up conceding them, but we can't concede them. Putin's inserted these things into a formalized shape right in the russian constitution and so he can't let him go either it's not the only reason he can't let him go but we're stuck with this and so i, I don't think there is a sustainable solution along these lines uh, especially as we do not see the end of the putin project in sight uh, we talked about prigozhin briefly earlier but um, the Putin regime has rather stabilized after being on the rocks for perhaps a year and a half. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be there in a few years. So, um, and Ukraine's agency is, is central here. You're not going to get, you're not going to get Ukrainians being keen to do this unless they're forced into it. Um, but I think that as things stand, giving those to Putin is uh, conducive to further escalation, not conducive to the um, uh, pacification of the conflict. How do I interpret the ethics of AI? That is a very big question. I might not be able to answer it. What rights do you think a synthetic consciousness with human analog subjective experiences should have? I do not think AI can have consciousness. 
conceptually that's impossible in my view any ideas how we can judge when it exists i will talk about this at some point on the philosophy channel because we do get a lot of these questions asked at the moment we're facing a big ai problem in politics of course because we've got the series of elections globally and we've got a situation where ai is unregulated and could be used to make all kinds of deleterious uh, side tangents in the political lives of um, countries. But I know that's not your question, but questions like what kind of a, an entity might AI become and what might it be capable of? Um, on top of doing mathematics, can it make art? Can it do philosophy? Um, and you're asking the consciousness question to which I gave a, a sort of a glib and rapid answer. We'll come back to that on the philosophy channel. Subscribe there, by the way, if you don't know that it exists. Let's have a look where we are. What is a Vlad Unleashed episode, Wolf? Jackson, how can Biden's decision-making capacity be beyond reproach? Um, I'm not talking about the decisions he makes. I'm talking about um, procedurally how the decisions are generated. In other words, is he sitting at a table confused with people telling him what to do and he says, fine? Or is he actually sitting there saying, while not being able to speak properly and fluffing his lines, saying, no, 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 yes. Actually, let's frame this issue. Here are the two central things you've got to consider when we're dealing with this issue. So let's run it for these two central considerations. Um, so to give you an example, when the war began, it seems like Biden um, said, guys, for now we'll start with two principles. One is avoid nuclear war, and two is do not prejudge the motivations of the Putin regime. Don't put them into a, a sort of a, a strategic box that we can uh, anticipate. Um, assume that we don't know why they're doing what they're doing for now. And these are the two principles he put. We do not understand them properly. Okay, let's not let's not put them into a Soviet Politburo box. Let's not put them into a NATO expansion box. Um, and people around Biden said, "Hey, this is this is them having a freak out about NATO expansion." And Biden said, "Let's not put it into that box, into any box, and just deal with it as it comes." And we do. Uh, very conservative nuclear escalation management. You might not like these, you might love them, but you see what I mean? I'm not talking about policies, I'm talking about whether he's in control of the framing of um, policy and um, institutionally who pu pushes what button, how and when. And I'm saying Biden is on top of that. That's compatible with disagreeing with literally every single policy of his, you see. Um, and the lack of capacity for strategy that I'm talking about is not willpower capacity. Notice, Jackson. It's democratic capacity that we are lacking, right? Um, the problem is, no matter how competent Biden was, if he had a great strategy, he, he wouldn't be able to push it through. He'd make speeches about it, but not enough people would listen or trust him. You see, so we have a democratic crisis of trust that is causing our strategic incapacity. The question is, how far, despite that crisis, can we sort of do roundabout fixes and generate a bit of a strategy? And I say, yes, we can get from almost zero where we currently are to 20%. I don't think we can get to 50% of a strategy. 
I just don't see the democratic capacity for that. I think that would be a, an historical mistake. And that's the sort of somewhat cruel tragedy of most um, beautiful um, Russian-Ukraine commentators at the moment in the expert community who are saying, guys, I get how this stuff is working. Why don't we do something? And I read these articles and I say, well, that that looks like it's an accurate account of what's going on. And I think that looks like it's a sound call for us to do something. Um, but the problem isn't a lack of willpower. The problem is more systemic than that. And so there's a cruel, there's a sort of a, um, a, a cruel element of running on the spot to nearly the entire um, public output of the expert community at the moment because much of it proceeds as though it's a failure of willpower. In reality, it's a failure of democratic capacity to create the conditions for the generation of a strategy. Uh, Alexander is saying the escalation fear has been the propaganda so far. I would say no. Um, I think that Putin is a nuclear risk if we appease him. Um, and he is a nuclear risk if we stand up to him. So there is no nuclear risk-free way of us years down the line coming out of this challenge. Um, I'm afraid. And that's why this story, or give Putin this or that, and then will come nuclear risk down, doesn't make sense. Because don't forget, the nutcase, Medvedev, who actually isn't a nutcase, we'll talk about that another time. Um, but what Medvedev, when he ventilates about all of this nuclear apocalypse he's threatening us with, is doing, is actually in lavatorial language, simply repeating Kremlin, Kremlin thinking. Um, so Russia poses a significant nuclear risk, and I'm privately telling off experts who go out and in an activist say, way say that it doesn't. Um, that, that just doesn't help. It's not truthful. And the, the best way to get us to, to a better place is through, through being truthful. You know, I heard the other day um, an expert being asked, somebody really fantastic actually, being asked, you know, do we have indications that Putin would not use nuclear weapons if Ukraine were taking Crimea? And the expert said, yes, we have such indications. And there is nothing the expert knows about this that other people don't know. There is nothing the expert knew about this that I don't know. And of course, we have no such indications, except the indication that Dave down the pub has by just turning on his mobile phone and reading the news. The indication is he probably won't. Well, it's fair enough to say that, but don't say we have indications. Uh, we don't. So there is no there is no benefit in playing down the nuclear risk. Um, it's in fact part of a truthful picture to acknowledge the nuclear risk, and use that as a way of understanding the significance of the challenge and the threat we're facing. Um, so the opposite, I would say that there is, um, in our sort of circles, nuclear risk diminution propaganda, uh, which is understandable, but actually it's not helpful to Ukraine in the end, because I think a truthful picture of the Kremlin project is most helpful to, to, to Ukraine's fate and to, to our strategic interests. Because Quite frankly, the truthful picture is pretty. Um, the truthful picture should be as motivating as anything we can imagine about getting into gear and challenging this stuff and developing steps toward a strategy. Uh, we don't need to sellotape sellotape bullshit to the truthful picture because it's pretty motivating. It's a pretty motivating picture. We've got a very bizarre, out of control imperial project that is stuck in 
linking regime security to foreign escalation, is armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons, and is increasingly um, absorbed by mystical visions that in the end are just about the whims of a single individual who um, has elections, needs elections, actually for whom elections are a very important ritual, but who essentially is now in a situation where there is nothing he can't do in domestic policy. So that's the stuff we're facing, and that's quite frankly serious enough. We don't need to massage anything. Um, you know, if you've got a rhinoceros running at you, there is really no benefit in exaggerating its size. Um, Suzanne is asking me if the USA is getting into anarcho-capitalism. In my view, no. Um, in my view, no. If our model is something like... Um, um 1990s russia where the state's capacity to filter and arbitrate and moderate markets wasn't just diminished but was in part obliterated and replaced by um, criminal patterns of behavior, um, collective and organizational criminal patterns of behavior. So um, we're not there, but our key aspect of what makes U.S. democracy, what U.S. democracy needs to be healthy, arbitrarily in the hands of market forces of various kinds. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Um, so that's not just a conversation about various mechanisms of exclusion. It's also a conversation about this, for instance, right? We are in the hands of a potato chip company, even right here on this platform that in many ways does a better job than other platforms and that's one of the four social forces this place is one of the four social forces that is a disruptive force on, on our democracies um th th there's a book by john gray called false dawn which he wrote in the late 90s and it's got reprinted more recently and John describes what happened in the 90s in, in, in Russia as a kind of anarcho-capitalism. And I think that is, fortunately for us, something of a qu quite different order to what is happening in any, in any Western country. But what I would say about the United States is that in all kinds of ways, economically and politically, um, it is the least healthy major Western democracy while also having institutions that are as strong as anybody else's. So the US stands out for this remarkable institutional strength, which means you can grind the institutions down for a long, long, long time before they break, hopefully. Um, but the level of, of toxicity is really, really bad um and sure i mean there is various kinds of very extreme economic endemic historical economic capture of u.s politics that would be that would be true um for instance about the hold the historical and enormously significant hold the fossil fuel industry has had over uh you know formal political entities in the United States. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, this wasn't a fantastic answer. Zonko, are you optimistic about the future? Hard to see a positive future considering climate change, AI, democratic decline. Um, so I'm very hopeful about the future and I'm not a doomist and I'm not a catastrophist and I'm full of hope for the future. 
But if your model of the future is that it should be like the recent past, then you're going to be in for a very, very bad surprise. The, the future will not be like the recent past. It'll be much worse um, in the West. But it will not be catastrophic. Um, even on the worst climate crisis scenarios, it will not be in the nearer, in the nearer decades catastrophic. Um, so this is what my uh, public intellectual colleague John Gray likes to say, sometimes steal from, from John. Um, he likes to say that we should be careful not to not to think that the future will be like the recent past. What the future will be like is like the past. If you think that the future will be like the past, it will be a mixed bag of remarkably beautiful things and enormously dark things. Um, but here, let's take the last century in European history, two massive wars. If, on the other hand, you take that post-1989 Kumbaya period that we had, um, let's say from 1991 till 2015, was it 2010? If that's what you are expecting, then you're going to be in for a very, very rough surprise. Um, but the doomist scenarios we will start talking about a bit more, but um, at the forefront would be some kind of societal collapse in the West mediated by climate change or maybe AI. And um, I do not expect societal collapse in Western countries in the decades to come. I expect societal collapse, unfortunately, in some countries in the world. I expect climate-mediated societal collapse in the next few decades in some countries. But I do not expect that in the West. What I think our biggest worry is in the West in terms of all the challenges, is democratic collapse. And in the in the near half, quarter to half a century, the main threat that the climate crisis poses to the West is democratic collapse. And that is so fascinating because it just shows how much everything rests on us keeping our democracies. Um, you know, we can't do any kind of proper policy on anything if we lose the institutions that we need to deliver these policies. But I think that there will be, for instance, many extreme hard right pro-climate crisis forces. This is very new today, but in the future we will get parties that say, we believe the climate crisis is really real, we've got to take it so seriously, we've got to adjust everything from a hard right um perspective that sort of drifts in the in in the uh, f word direction in the fascism word but it needs to be explained what the purpose of using such a word is so let's leave that for the moment but uh we're going to get very ugly exclusionary divisive i would say racist also politics that centers the climate crisis. It's going to be a very different future to today when it's the left and the center that tends to push the, the climate emphasis. Flutter creep. Are the undemocratic parties better left isolated and kept out of power? Or should they be embraced by mainstream society? Um, this is, there's an ethical paradox here. How do you go about treating as opponents and not enemies political competitors in your country who do treat you as enemies? So if Trump tells you you're my enemy, how do you tell Trump you're not my enemy, you're my opponent, even though you are out there to break democratic checks and balances, democratic institutions? That's a difficult balance. Um, and we have to keep striving to make it. Um, one of the things that's really important here is that we don't pretend we've won arguments we haven't won. There is a tendency to say, well, if that person is out to break institute to break democratic institutions and all of their supporters um, must be no good citizens, 
and therefore should be rejected as genuine citizens. Well, that's a catastrophe. That's a catastrophic approach. So you can't basically rule out citizens from sharing the table of politics with you unless, more or less, they directly threaten violence. These are difficult balances to strike. Here's another really difficult balance to strike with anti-democratic politics. Where do you start? Do you start by opposing it? Or do you start with my four plus four story by saying, hey guys, we can't defeat Trump until we understand how we brought it about that Trump is happening. What's the order of priority here? That has to be balanced too. Do you just begin to say no? Or do you go about analyzing and ask questions like, well, what did we do to bring this about? Which is a very important question. Often, contrary to what it seems like I would say, because I always talk about this four plus four, I actually think very often you do need to start by saying no to these people. But saying no to them does not mean saying that they are enemies, because very often there is no effective politics. That, well, you've said they're an enemy, what's next? You have to actually defeat them. And that means real politics. So I think to some extent that distinction too will just dissolve. Are they an enemy? Are they an opponent? No, that you need to defeat them um, in accordance with the rules of the game, even if they're trying to break the rules of the game. One of the other questions that arises here is how much do you scoop from the discourse of populism, right? The kind of discourse that bridges the way a democracy um, justifies things to itself in general terms with kitchen table talk and rough kitchen table talk at that. How do you do that? Can you scoop some things from that? Um, borrow some things from that? How many? Without yourself becoming an irresponsible uh, example of populism and so on. So, yes, relative time, time works. You're quite right that obviously Trump is, is a symptom of deeper problems. Um, he's, it's very significant not to treat anti-democratic politicians as an aberration. They're part of a pattern. And let me now introduce another pattern. That's not necessarily a reflection of what's happening in Portugal at the moment, but it's a general principle. Um, democracies will be very slow to collapse. They are surprisingly resilient. Some democracies may collapse in the next few decades, but they're, they're surprisingly resilient entities, and they endure in crisis, and in long-term crisis they endure. However, one of the patterns I think is very important to acknowledge is rapidity not the rapidity of democratic collapse but the rapidity of the rise of anti-democratic forces to prominence in in a democracy they're they're prominent in some democracies but not prominent in others but this this idea of rapidity is really really basic it's obviously not a complex idea I'm just just means literally something that is got one percent of the vote can go to 20 in in two or three years so that doesn't mean democracies are going to collapse but it means that even if you're in a democracy that seems to be low on uh you know significant anti-democratic forces given the waters we are in all these social forces all this crisis of trust um Prominent anti-democratic politics can rise in virtually any country within two or three years if it's not there today. That does not mean the democracy will collapse. You know, this is one of the things we have to understand too, as we live through democracies being in crisis. They're compatible states, crisis and democracy. But the rapidity of the rise of these forces is, is something we have to get used to and something that we struggle to accept still as possible and 
likely because we're still stuck in that post 1989 order where meant to we're all meant to be you know give or take one or 71 ups and downs drifting in a democratic direction um, so there's this possibility for a rapid rise of anti-democratic forces in virtually whatever democratic society you live in. And that's a feature of where we are, and we shouldn't be shocked by it. But the good news is we're resilient. Um, not infinitely resilient, but we're resilient. background noise don't know what the background noise is unless it's an airplane overhead Relative time works is talking about the collapse of democracies um, still not being not being blatantly obvious. The illusion will persist long past when it is functionally gone. Um, I I don't believe in the collapse of democracies. You see, I think that's a risk. Um, but I'm talking about decline rather than collapse. Well, what I would say is that part of the reason that um, I'm you know, confiscating so much time from you and keeping you all here is that I believe that there are moments of moment that occur in democracies um, where it's possible to save your democracy. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw with the 50,000 people that came out for Navalny, for Navalny's funeral over a couple of days in Russia, is that it's a very stable tyranny, which you can't shift. You can shift tyrannies late on when they're flailing and frail, or early on, very early onset. You can sometimes nip them in the bud. Um, and we have to be ready in different countries that we are in when moments of moment come um, of this kind. A lot of Israelis bef before October 7 felt that, quite frankly, this was all sort of done in abstraction of what's happening outside of the green line. So Israel's democracy crisis, the crisis within the green line only, and all kinds of hell is happening outside the green line. But... Um, within it, Israelis were feeling, ooh, our democracy is drifting away from us, but we can do something about this. Um, th this is, we saw a similar story in Poland recently. So we're going to have moments of moment that come our way in our democracies where it, it is actually possible to change the situation. There's a set of things we can do that'll stop the bad thing from happening. And I think part of the reason I'm, we're all gathered here, might be five other reasons, but probably one of the top five reasons is that um, it would be good as citizens to be prepped for that situation even when it occurs in your society. It might occur in 2030, it might occur in 2027, um, and being prepped for it. And also just kind of on a, almost on an emotional level, um, you know, ready for that challenge when it comes. It is really, really important. What you don't want to happen, and this is a big risk Western societies face, is for that to occur and for Western citizens to sleepwalk through it. 
So, for instance, one of the reasons I'm critical of the hyper-identity politics is that these citizens deeply absorbed in it will actually be asleep when their democracy is about to fragment. They'll be arguing about hyper-identity politics um, issues. Um, when that happens, and that is going to wash away whatever concerns they have about anything in a, in a, in a short matter of time. So we've got to be, first of all, awake to this possibility so that we see it when it's happening for what it is rather than being in denial. And uh, then we've we got to uh, recognize that there'll be a there'll be a possibility for um, both a good and a bad outcome when that fork in the road comes our way. And it's very important to not be sort of really, really dreamy when some of our democracies reach it. So that's what I think. Um, Johnny is asking if I think simple majorities create vulnerability in democracy. No, I, 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 I don't, I mean, I, I don't think that, um, the crisis we're facing is just part of the structural issue of democracy that you can state abstractly. I think what we're facing is a set of, um, uh, hello, Corinne. Um, I think what we're facing is a set of challenges that are, that are contingent and historically produced. Um, so, Who has survived this life successfully? Um, I'm grateful to you for staying with me. Um, we've done, uh, we've done our best. I've done our best. I've done my best to make sense. I'm sorry if I haven't made enough sense, uh, but we're going to be back and we're going to stay uh, connected. Yes, you get a sticker for surviving i don't even know how stickers work um in the in the youtube community um there are literal stickers i think is that just for 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 members i have no idea um anyway my brain is melting down and i'm very grateful to have had you all with me um Let's love and talk soon. Bye-bye.